Okay, so I'm going to do a poll before we, I'm going to do like a, an analog poll and then an electronic poll. You'll see what that means in a minute. But so just to see, kind of like not, you're not going to be in trouble, but just to see how many of you brought a Bible with you. Hold your Bible up really high. Let me see it. Okay, hold it up there. One, <laughs> nope, not phone, Bible. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty. Good, about twenty. All right. wasn't a trick question. It wasn't a tr- it wasn't a trick question. Okay, how many of you brought your phone? Hold it up. All right, too many to count. But we have a way of counting that too. Okay, so. We have a system that we tried out the other Wednesday night, which is, is kind of interesting because it, it gives us a chance to see what's going on in the body, okay? And so if you would, um, we're going to ask you to pull your phone out, okay? Ask you to pull your phone out, and we're gonna give you a way to text that'll come into, the, it'll come into the, uh, your phone, it'll go back to the computer back there, and immediately we'll be able to see the results up here, okay? Not your name, all right? So pull your phone out, and then there's, you put that up there, Steve, that first slide. Text that number to that number, 530-309-1321, the word Joe, which is uh, short for Joseph, all right? First service, it was Mary. This service, it's Joe, okay? So you text 530-309-1321 and the word Joe, okay? And once you do that, then you'll get some questions coming back to you that you reply with the number next to the question, okay? And then um, I'll put that up there in a minute. So go ahead and text Joe to 530-309-1321. Everybody got that? Looks like everyone's like paying attention. So you should get this back. So put that up there, Steve. You should get this. What are your feelings about Christmas? It's my favorite time of year. I find it stressful. It's not a good season for me. Okay? So there's the choices. Already there's 29, 30, going up, 30 people. And last time, last, um, I think we had about, I don't know, close to 80 people that responded. Then we said stop. So... If you still haven't texted that, Joe, to that number, that number's still up there, and then there's the questions. All right. Quiet, quiet, quiet. 47, 48. Gives me a chance to drink some water. So Paulo is here. How many enjoyed his message last week? Paulo. And Veronica. So in the hallway, I was talking to Paulo and Veronica, and I, I asked him, uh, how long are you here for? And so he pulled out his Google Translator, speaking of own, he pulled out his Google Translator, and, but he didn't turn it on for me, he turned it on for him, and then he spoke, you know, Portuguese in there, blah, 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 blah. And he, goes, and he showed it to me, it says, uh, I have a black toothache. <laughs> I'm like, what, what, you, I, what do you mean? And he did it again, he goes, Zach is at home with a toothache because I asked if he could interpret, and so he pulled the Google thing out. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. 74, I'm trying to waste time. 75, trying to fill time, not waste it. Okay, is that enough, you think? You get a good idea? It'll still, it'll still come up even after we put the results up there. But let's go ahead and put the results up there, Steve. Yeah, it's still coming in. So you see 67% says it's my favorite time of year, 
20%, I find it stressful. 12%, 10 people said it's not a good season for me. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. And as Shaughnessy has prayed about your word, we pray that it would touch our hearts, that we would hear from you that your thoughts and your words and your character, Lord, is important to us. And so we ask that we would be students this morning of, of who you are, and it would change us, Lord, that your word would change us. So we ask you, Father, just to add your spirit to the word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're gonna talk about Christmas. Uh, it's interesting that uh, you know we got to see those results last service. There was only two people that said it was not a good time of year for them. Normally, if you ask a person, not normally, I would say nine times out of nine, or 10 out of 10, or 100 out of 100, if you ask a person why Christmas is not a good season for them, it'll go back to something relational. It'll go back to a loss of a loved one, or it'll go back to no loved one being there, or some kind of a relational difficulty. Um, if you ask someone why that season is so important to you, it's your favorite time of year, chances are you woke up on Christmas morning as a kid and were really happy. But that's not the case for everyone. And, uh, and so today, we're gonna open up the Christmas story, if you will, out, found in Luke and uh, Matthew, parts and pieces of it. And uh, we are not in Mark today. Uh, we've been in Mark for 12 weeks. But Mark does not have the account of the Christmas story in it, but Matthew and Luke do. And so we're gonna take a couple of parts from there, and we're gonna try to do some uh, uh, understanding of a concept or something that we could pull from this scripture about the Christmas story, about how it might relate to us, okay? So now you can open your Bible, and by the way, the number of people with phones far outweighed the number with people in, with Bibles, so... Um, we saw that up there too. So if you do have a Bible, bring it, because it's just, it's just, it's just very, very, very important to get used to your Bible. I, I believe that one day before, not, not, probably not before I pass away, but sometime in the future, more than likely your electronic device will be shut off. I'm just, I'm just saying that, okay? I'm not prophesying that, but if it did happen, you should have one of these. Right, because they can't uh, shut that off. All right, now, so with that being said, bring your Bibles, just get used to it. And Pastor Craig said, amen. <laughs> All right, so before we get into the Bible story, uh, the Bible story, the Christmas story, I wanna ask a question, another question without using the uh, technology. How many of you have ever made some plans? You had great expectations of those plans, you had a, you had your mind set on those plans only to find those plans completely faded, gone. Didn't, didn't work out that way. Didn't work out as I planned it, right? How many of you remember when you had children or you have children now or remember when you were a child and you had a plan, you had a plan that you were gonna eat uh, you know, the Pez candy before dinner and you had a plan and you saw that Pez over there, you got it and you had your eyes on it I'm, the reason why I say this is because this just happened to our grandson the other day. He wanted to eat that candy before he had his dinner. And when he didn't get his way as his way was planned, he had a little bit of a meltdown. I mean, I love that boy, but it reminds me of me, even at an older age, sometimes my first reaction, if I don't get to do what I had planned to do, then my human nature kicks back and responds with a, oh good, that'll be, the better, that'll be the better of the two choices. No. Normally when we have a plan, it doesn't go our way, our response is not very positive, it usually tries to reject that plan and continue to push through anyway, or at some point if the plan doesn't work out, you get angry, or if the plan you know, uh, continues not to work out and your expectation stays there, then the anger sometimes will turn to depression well, just a little thing that happened to me, when I grew up, and I played a lot of sports, 
I went to school and, and college to play sports, but in my mind's eye, I wanted to be a coach teacher. I wanted to get a degree. I wanted to be a coach and a teacher. And I, I, uh, uh, that did not work out. That did not work out as planned. I quit school when I was a junior at uh, UC Davis. And um, I, at, at first I was okay with that because my intention was to go to work and get married. And so I went to work, had a pretty good job, then the economy went bad, and I found myself back at the school that I tried to get a degree at. It was the only place I could get work, and I took a job as a custodian working graveyard at UC Davis. Now, I was happy to have the job because I needed income because I wanted to get married, but on the inside, I was depressed. I'm like, I did not plan on this. Middle of the night, cleaning toilets, uh, was not my plan. And it really bothered me for a long time. And I never told anybody, and so I just worked harder. I tried harder, I tried to get out of that, and sure enough, I did. I succeeded and I kept climbing the ladder, so to speak, at UC Davis but I never had what I thought was my, the desire of my heart. And so then I became not only angry about it, but I became very depressed about it, secretly depressed. Nobody knew that on the inside, I was very, 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 very uh, not happy with my lot in life. And then I could give you my rest of my story, but this isn't about me today. This is about the birth of Christ. This is about the birth of Christ. And we have to reach, we should reach a place in our walk with Christ where Jesus surpasses everything else that we have and that we know because he's certainly at the epicenter of all we have and all we know. And so something happened uh, as God's uh, plan un, un, you know, unfolded before time began. He had a plan to send forth his son, born of a virgin, right? And uh, to, to carry, if you will, out the requirements or the righteousness that man was asked to do that he couldn't do, and he carries it out, and then he steps in our place, dies a criminal's death, and he is buried and resurrected, just a simple gospel right there. And that was God's plan before the foundations of the world. And I just want to read the accounts of the birth of Christ found a little bit in Luke and a little bit in Matthew, starting with Matthew 1. This was God's plan as it unfolded. Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, which means engaged, when Mary had been engaged to Joseph, before they came together, that means before they consummated their marriage, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. They were engaged, and she was pregnant. And her husband, Joseph, fully embraced it and said, oh, good, that's a better plan than the one I had. No. No. The man that she was engaged to had nothing to do with that pregnancy, and he knew it. And so his first response was probably more than likely, like a lot of our responses, when something goes completely different than you had planned. Joseph had a plan to marry uh, Mary and to stay celibate until consummation of the marriage, to raise a family, to have children, and to live a life. That was his plan, more than likely. I'm sure he had one. And it was suddenly interrupted when his uh, fiance reports to him that she was pregnant. That's a big change of plan. So uh, his reaction here is, is pretty evident, and you'll see what it was. His reaction is this, and Joseph, her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So his plan was to quietly remove himself from that situation and get a divorce. So his plan, notice this, his plan was not that plan. 
But he had a plan to overcome that plan, and the plan to overcome that plan was to divorce. Was to divorce. I'm just going to walk away from this. And the only good there was that he didn't want to put her to open shame, so he was just going to quietly walk away, right? That was his plan. All right. Now let's shift back to Mary and see what happens with Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. So God sends an angel to Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. So the angel goes and speaks to Mary of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Okay, I don't know what Mary was doing at the time. We know that she was probably looking forward to her wedding, looking forward to consummating the marriage and having a family. And all of a sudden, this angel shows up and says, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. So her response was, we get to see it, she was greatly troubled. Like, what? What is this? And she tried to discern what sort of greeting is this. She never had an angel speak to her. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And then Mary thought that was an unusual plan, right? I don't understand that plan, so she asked a question. How will this be since I'm a virgin? How am I supposed to have a baby? I'm a virgin. I don't understand your plan. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, he had more information to tell her, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. So her relative Elizabeth could not have children She's old, and the angel tells her, by the way, she's pregnant. For nothing will be impossible with God. People, a lot of people quote that scripture, but this is where it's found. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. She starts to, she starts to shift something here, which is a picture, if you will, of a, a really, really good shift to adjust what her plan was to what God's plan was. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. If you said it, I'm willing to receive it. And the angel departed from her. So you see how she received that at first? Like, how's this gonna happen? Well, then she believed what she heard and she accepted it. And there's Joseph, on the other hand, trying to figure out, um, what am I gonna do here? How's this all gonna work out, right? Well, we know that um, the baby was born, okay? So let's just keep moving along here and go back to Matthew 1, verse 20. Back to Joseph's story. But as he considered these things, behold, he getting a little help here. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, and this is found in Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name, and everyone say, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. So before we even get into this takeaway, if you will, about his plans, our plans, our plan to make it our plan no matter what, or our plan to accept his plan, one must put that little name in between there. If you are going to be able to shift from your plan to his plan, you must have an Emmanuel 
you must have an understanding that God is with you. God was with me cleaning toilets. God is with us. God steps out of time and space in the heavens and joins us here for a purpose, for a plan that his father had. And he planned on using Joseph and Mary to ordinary people to execute his plans. And he's still doing that today. He's still doing that today. Not, not bringing forth another Jesus, but certainly executing whatever his plan is and to carry out the work inside of his kingdom. The problem with most of us, we, we, we react just like Joseph. I can tell you, I remember, I can't tell you how many times that I literally would think about what I should have had instead of what I was doing. My expectations were still stuck in my head. And so I wanted what I thought I deserved or what I wanted to have. I wasn't willing to accept where I was at in that moment. I wasn't willing to be content with it. And so in part of God's plan, I guess he had me learn how to patch holes in walls with tape and texture because I was so mad that I would punch holes in walls a lot. I was angry at his plan. I didn't like that plan. In fact, I just shoved God away because I didn't like what was going on. But again, this story is not about me. This is about Jesus wanting to come in and wanting to take away our sin. That's his primary plan. His secondary plan is to make you like him. His secondary plan is for you to walk in a surrendered state according to his will. Now, if we're going to mature, you might have brand new believers in here, and you might have some that are trying to follow Christ, you might have some that have followed Christ for a long, long time. The ones that have followed Christ for a long, long time don't have as much trouble surrendering to God's will because they've learned that each and every time they surrender that God has something good. And the good is him. You may not get something good as you surrender. You may have a real challenge to walk through just like Joseph and Mary. Mary had a little bit of an exit strategy. She could spend time with Elizabeth. The babies jumped and leaped in the womb. You could read that in scripture as well. And, and so she had a, a period of time where she was just alone with Elizabeth and they were talking about their supernatural pregnancy. But Joseph, all the while, they're probably saying, hey, where's Mary? He probably didn't want to tell anybody. He probably felt like she was in hiding. So they had to walk the plan out. You don't just surrender and it all goes away. You surrender to God's plan, then you have to walk it out. Then you have to persevere through great challenges and difficulties at times. Because his plan may not look like your plan, it may not smell like your plan, and you will never know if it was his plan or not until you get through with it and you look back and you go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my, oh my goodness gracious, that had to have been you. And you begin to look for God in the details of your journey and you will find him even in great tragedy, even in great crisis, even in great sufferings, you will find God's plan. He is so sovereign and so faithful and so merciful that he'll allow great tribulation to filter through his hands with a hope of a good purpose and a good plan for you. I used to hate it when people would say, oh, God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, it's true, but it may not be the plans that you had. It may not be your plans, but it is true that he has a plan. Number one plan is that you would come to faith, that you would come to realization that I've got this problem and God is opposed to this problem called sin, but he's given me a solution. His name is Jesus. That's why in the fullness of of his time, he brought forth his son, Emmanuel, as his plan, God be with us to take away the sins of the world. That was his primary plan. Before the foundations of the world were ever even framed, he had that plan to save you. I mean, that's that's uh, um, amazing, really, if you think about it. Now, how can I say this stuff unless I back it up with scripture? So let's go to look at a few other scriptures, okay? 
So turn to um, Isaiah 55, verses eight and nine. And I want you to, as we're reading this, I want you to have a context of what your thoughts are, what your plans are versus his, okay? Isaiah 55, eight, nine. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Okay, are you willing to accept that? He thinks differently than us, and his ways are different than ours. For, the, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. He's got a greater way. And my thoughts than your thoughts. His thoughts are greater. His ways are greater. Look at Proverbs 16, 9. Proverbs 16, 9. Flip there or look up here. Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes steps. You could plan your way, but those of us that are in Christ, that are hidden there, even if we make a wrong turn, this is really good news, even if we make a wrong step, God can turn the Titanic around. Or he could use the partial shipwreck for good. That's how good God is. I want, to just, I want to just take a minute here and I want to read. I wrote a few things down. See if I, if I can't remember them, I'll have them in front of me. But let's just talk about this guy, David. David thought that he was going to be a shepherd. He thought he was going to grow up shepherding sheep. God had a different plan. God came to him with the prophet Samuel, the anointed him king. And King David, right, became king of Israel, that we read about even in the birth of Christ, from the lineage of David came Christ. He had a plan of just being a shepherd. But then we go 180 degrees from him and you take a look at uh, Jonah. Jonah was a prophet asked by God to go to the city of Nineveh to tell the people their sins and ask them to repent. He didn't like that plan, so he tried to run from God and found himself in a fish. You know that story, right? So he found out that not following God's plan it's kind of smelly and ugly and quite dangerous, all right? And then we take Saul. We take Saul. His plan was to shut down Christianity. His plan was to stop Christians. His plan was to go to the governors and get paperwork so that he could kill Christians. This was Paul's plan, and he was carrying it out. But God had a better plan. He stops him in his tracks, and he becomes the Apostle Paul. That was God's plan for, for Paul long before the foundations of the world. What is it for you? Sometimes you won't find out what that plan is until you surrender the one you have for yourself. Sometimes you won't find out what God's plan is in the middle of a great trial because you're unable to see him in the details of that trial because you haven't surrendered to the sovereignty of God. You're trying to fight your way out or plan your way out of his plan. And sometimes his plan doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good. But if you ultimately know that his plan is to make you more like Christ and you start to surrender to that, then the person that walks away from you or the person that despises you and you would rather just run away but if you understand that God is trying to work all things together for the good, maybe he's allowed that to happen so that he can teach you to forgive. Maybe he's allowed that to happen so that he can have you to understand that the grace that he's given us, even when we make major train wreck mistakes, can be turned around and used for good. Then maybe he could turn them around for good too. And maybe his plan, maybe in part, was to use you to show him who Jesus was. I mean, there's the, the, the ideas are limitless when we start thinking about maybe his plan is better than mine. Maybe it just is. So Joseph, you can imagine his plan and Mary's plan. Their plan was to get married and have children. And God had a bigger plan, a different plan a far grander plan, but they had to persevere. Next week, we'll talk about the actual birth, the census, the birth. You know, I picked, sometimes I picture 
things, and I read this the other day, I go, that's, that's, that's a great picture. This one town had a, had a bunch of potholes in it. It was a small town, this true story, I saw the picture of it, and the potholes got so bad that there were ground, you know, dirt underneath there. So this guy, during Christmas, asked the city manager, hey, all I want for Christmas is that pothole filled. And so he planted a Christmas tree inside that pothole. Think about that a minute. Sometimes our expectations or our thoughts about Christmas don't look anything about how it really happened, about how dark it was, about King Herod and, and how he was trying to wipe out the babies that were born because he thought they were gonna take away his kingship. I mean, it was a dark time. And we'll talk more about that next week. The real reality of the backdrop of, Christ, uh, of Christmas really makes Jesus more of a savior than a Christmas present underneath a tree or a family meal. The one story that comes to my mind that demonstrates both not your plan, surrendering to the plan, falling in love with the plan that you didn't plan, is Brent and Sharon Thompson. Brent and Sharon Thompson were not Christians and they went through a divorce and then they met each other and they got married and they had a blended family. They talked about having their own child and 24, almost 25 years ago, their son was born and he was born with all kinds of complications. They tried surgeries, they tried everything. It was during the middle of all of that that they both came back to Christ. They found each other. They got close to each other during this little boy's illness. His name was Brandon. And then they had, to, they had to hear the news that your son will never walk, your son will never talk, and he won't live until seven at most. That was what they said. And they had to somehow or another Somehow or another, with their newfound faith, walk that journey out. I'm happy to report that the doctors were wrong, that Brandon lived to be almost 25, right? But the sad reality of it is, even though they knew that one day they'd be separate from Brandon, they didn't know when. They didn't know when God, God's plan was to take little Brandon home, but he did just a few days ago, just a matter of a week ago. He swooped him up while we were here last Sunday. I could just see Jesus and, and God and his plan, and he's looking and he goes, I, I think that family right there will do just fine for this little boy. I think that they might surrender to the good that can come out of this little boy. If any of you ever met Brandon, you will always remember him, nicknamed Bubba, because of his great big smile, huge smile. And everywhere that they took Brandon or everyone that went into his home fell in love with him. He didn't need a word, he had a smile. And then that smile would teach you to think, how come I can't smile? That smile would make me think of how much love was demonstrated and poured through his parents into that boy. But at some point, they had to come to realization that this wasn't my plan, but this is the life that I've been given. How could we make the most out of it? I don't think that they had to work too hard. They fell in love with him so much. But he was to never live anywhere else the whole entire time except with Brent and Sharon. The whole entire time, they never thought, you know, this is too much, and God gave them the strength, they made them away. And so they surrendered to God's plan, and they're having to surrender to it again in his passing. Jesus says, or, or in Isaiah, they, the prophet Isaiah says about, about coming Jesus that he's a, 
a man stricken with grief, acquainted with sorrows and stricken with grief. He understands the pain of Brent and Sharon. In fact, he was so grieved, Jesus was, now that he was born, even though he knew that his plan was to one day go to the cross, even though he knew it because he was God living inside of a, 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 a human, right? So he had this humanity and divinity going at the same time all the time, and we really see it very plainly there because he was not really all that willing in one moment to go with God's plan. And we could see that in Scripture when he goes out into the garden the night before his crucifixion, and he says, Lord, God, Father, if there be any other way, take it from me. And then he followed that up by something that we could all follow up, these plans that we get that weren't ours, by saying, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And then he surrenders to the Father's plan, which was to be openly shamed, spit on, whipped, stricken. For us, the reason why he came. God's plan before the foundations of the world to bring forth his son, God, with us. And he's still with us. And he's with every one of you that are trying to fight hard to go back to what you plan instead of surrendering to right where you're at. It may seem like a big mess, but until we surrender to right where you're at, you're about to make it a bigger mess. I want to read you another scripture that's really fascinating to me. This one is found in Isaiah 46, 8. This is where we get that one saying. Here's the saying that God knows the end at the beginning. He knows the very end at the beginning. Isaiah 46, 8. Remember this and stand firm. That's a really good word. If we will remember this, then we'll stand firm. Recall it to mind, you sinners, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the very end from the very beginning. Nobody knows how to do that but God. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. He'll accomplish his purpose. Can you be willing to surrender to where you're at, knowing that he has a purpose? I'm glad that Joseph and Mary did. I mean, Mary didn't really have a a choice. I guess she had a choice. Joseph had a choice. Stand by her or to exit. And we know that he did. Fascinating enough, though, that we don't know what happens to Joseph in Scripture. But we know that he was there when the baby was born. (laughs) He stood by her. Which reminds me of another story that uh, I don't want to keep you long, you know, with stories and stuff like that. But sometimes you hear a story and it helps you to understand this story. So I'm going to share something with you. And a lot of you know this, but... um, Whenever I, whenever I read the name Joseph, I, I, I constantly go to my father because a pastor told me one day, he goes, hey, you ought to read the story of Joseph. And he says, but it'll give you a lot more respect for stepfathers, it'll give you a lot more respect for people that adopt children. Now, before that, you know, I didn't know anything about my own story. But once I found out about my story, all of a sudden, my dad, Jim Oots, became Joseph. And I didn't find out until I was 50 that he wasn't my real father. That's how much that man loved me. I could have never known. If anything, he may have loved me a tad more than my sisters who were his children. But the story is crazy, you see, because my mom had a story like Mary, but she wasn't conceived from the Holy Spirit. And she wanted desperately in her fear to not be the woman that was pregnant without being married. And so she tried to abort the baby several times. She's given me permission to tell this story. Then she gets married to Jim Oots and tells him nothing about her pregnancy and says, will you marry me? Yes. They get married. 
He's in the Air Force. He takes her uh, about three months later to the uh, Air Force physician to do a prenatal check. And sometimes I wonder what that was like because like I wonder a lot about scripture. I wasn't there in the room that day when the Air Force doctor looked at my mom and dad and said, hey, uh, everything's fine, Linda. Uh, you're six months along. They will be born in three months and they were only married for three months and the baby will be born in three. And, they, and so my dad suddenly discovers, find out that he was deceived by my mom. So for my dad to somehow to submit to a plan that was not his plan changed the destiny of my life and his and my mom's and my boys and my wife and so on and so on and so on as he surrendered to a plan that was not his. I'll never forget the day I found out that story. I wanted to run to him. I wanted to grab my mom and hug her and say, Mom, I don't hold any of that against you. I'm so glad you're free. You got that secret out. And I wanted to run with my dad and say, you are my hero. Oh, yeah. He had a hard time with all of that. That's another story. But it's, it just, every time I go into this book, every time I think of Joseph, I think of my dad. And then I have profound respect for others that step into the place of a father or a mother of children who don't have one. Profound respect. My dad told me the story. It was so hard, he took my mother back home three different times. He couldn't do it until my mom, my mom was, the, the day before I was born, he went back, picked her up, or was gonna pick her up, but she was too pregnant, and told her, I want to be that baby's father and I want to be your husband, but we will never talk about it again. So he surrendered to that moment and he did a wonderful job. And every time I think of that, I think, you know what? There's times in my life where I'm gonna have to surrender. There's times in my life where lots of things are gonna come my way that I don't want, that I don't like but my God is greater and he has established a plan before the foundations of this world. He's perfectly sovereign, he's perfectly good, and he knows the end at the beginning and all I gotta do is somehow, some way, trust the outcome before the outcome happens and knowing the outcome was his. And the same applies to you today. The same applies to you today. And so Christmas, at least for today, was God's plan. His plan was to come, to bring forth Emmanuel, to bring forth his son in the fullness of his time to take away our sins so we could be, in Galatians, sons and daughters of God. That was his plan from the beginning. Have you surrendered to that plan? Are you here this morning, never even surrendered to that plan that he wants to call you his son, that he wants to choose you and take you with him into eternity forever and ever. That was his plan. Here's another one. Not a person in this room had a plan to be born. You never had a plan to be born. You never had a plan or a choice as to what family you would be born in. You never had a choice to, to, that, that, that when someone walked away from you or maybe you had some choices that you created problems, but by and large, right, by and large, you have a choice to make on whether to surrender to him or not. Amen. At the end of the message today is a great song. I, 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 I didn't know that we were gonna use this song until after first service and I saw a couple people come forward. What a great time just to come if the Lord has spoken to you, that maybe you're struggling with the lot that you've been given in life, and maybe God wants you to just say, hey, I, I'm gonna take care of this, just surrender to my plan, then just, you could do that in, in, where you're sitting, or you could do that up here. If you've never received Christ before, you've never given him the opportunity to execute his plan for your life, which is to call you his own son and daughter, and to, just to bring you up 
and, and literally like hold you and look you in the eye. You can't see him, but he's there and he says, hey, I love you, just you, just you. I love you, I died for you. Not based upon what you did good or what you didn't do good. I died for you, I gave my life up for you. That's why he came. The disciples, lastly, the disciples, all through their journey with Jesus, they were right by him. They still wanted their own plan. They still th wanted to be the greatest. They still thought he was gonna come and conquer things. They had their own expectations, their own idea of the plan. And we can see that at one point when Jesus kept telling him, my plan is to go to the cross and die. They didn't like that plan. Remember what Peter said? He goes, no, 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 not you, but me. I, my plan is I'll take your place. And Jesus had to rebuke him and say, get behind me, Satan, because he knew that was his destiny. We don't get to understand. We don't get to pick the plans that God has for us. He does. We just get to agree with him. That's a heavy Christmas message. But man, once you realize that God's been with you that whole entire time, the whole entire time, and you start to see the way he's woven his grace and his tapestry and his love through the invisible mystery of who he is, then you get a little joy in your heart, a little bounce in your step, and then you, then you literally can't wait to see what God's gonna do next, even if it hurts. The ushers would come forward and pass out communion. Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Many of the plans that we have, but his purposes are the ones that will stand. They'll remain. God is with us. God is with us. While communion is going around, before they sing that song, um, we're gonna have communion before they sing the song. They could keep strumming Dallas, that's good. And I, I just want you to, to hear this scripture in context. See if you can put Romans 8, 28 up first. Romans 8, 28, how many of you know that scripture? Raise your hand, uh, many people do. How many of you know the whole context of the scripture? Okay, it's very important. So put 828 up first. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Those that are called according to his purpose. Now go back to 818. I just wanna read a few verses, then we'll skip a bunch and go back to 26, 27, 28. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I want you to get a picture here, you guys. I, I really want you to get a picture here. When you are going through a hard time, when you are suffering, when you are weighing down heavy laden and burdened with whatever is going on, I want you to picture Brent and Sharon. I want you to picture how they had to surrender over and over and over. Every time they turned around, they, he had a need. And they were suffering under watching his suffering, they were suffering. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be real, revealed to us. I guarantee you, God's glory was revealed to Brandon last Sunday morning. Whoop. Full glory. 
keep going. Next verse. 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. All of creation awaits us at the adoption of being sons and daughters of God. Keep going. For the creation was subject, to, you guys really, really pay attention to this. This is hard word, but I want you to really get it. Take it home, read it again. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. None of us subject to suffering. But because of him who subjected it in hope, ah, there's a purpose behind it, that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is his plan. This is his purpose. This is something good out of something bad. Next. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So where your groanings and where your pain is as you go through this this transition of understanding this new lot that you have in life or this, this, this purpose or this plan that's been carrying out itself, keep going. And not only the whole creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit in us, groaning inwardly as we await eagerly for the full adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies back to Him. Heaven, keep going. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? It's what you don't see that you hope for. But it's what you believe that God is doing something good in the middle while you wait. But if we hope for what we did not see, we wait for it with patience. Next verse. Likewise, the Spirit even helps us in our weakness. You guys, this is so powerful. When you are so weak that you don't know how to pray, that you just groan, it says we don't even know what we ought to be praying for, but the Spirit himself prays for us with groanings too deep for words. That means the Holy Spirit is actually praying on our behalf. I mean, that's love. Next. And he searches our hearts. And he who searches our hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints. What? How? How? According to the will of God. And then the famous verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. How many of you could say, God had a purpose for me being in jail. God had a purpose for me not getting what I wanted. God didn't want me to eat candy before I ate real food. God has a purpose. He has a way. It's his way. We got to get out of his way. I want to go back to kind of where we started. It's not about you. His love was for you. It was given to you. It was demonstrated on the cross. He saved you. He did. He truly did. It was about you. And now it's about everyone else. Now it's about glorifying him, him being at the epicenter, God with us, Emmanuel. What a great, there is no greater time than now in the spirit of what we're, what we're in giving and thanks, you know, being, coming off of Thanksgiving and into Christmas is not just to take care of our own family, but to look after the needs of others. If you're here this morning before we take communion, um, if you're here this morning and you know somewhere where a, a, a a gal and her three children can go. They, they're going to probably not have anywhere to go after today. And uh, they have money for rent. They just can't get someone to open the door for them. If you know a place, if you know a way, wow, then we could surely say, God had a plan. He's never, he's never early, but he's seldom late. 
I hope there's someone here that maybe can go, wow, I think I know some place that might rent to them. But now back to the table. After he went out in that garden, he prayed for another way. God sent him angels to strengthen him, it says, and he surrendered to God's will, and the rest is history, our salvation, because he took God's plan and the purpose that he had, and he gave up his life for us. This is his body. He says at that table, the night before the crucifixion, this is my body that will be given to you, broken and given up for you. Take and eat. This is the cup of the new covenant, the blood, the ratification of the remission of sin, the guarantee of that covenant to never hold you in contempt or put you away ever again because of your unholiness. That's love. It was poured out and his father was well pleased. Let's drink together. <clears throat>